I will go ahead and do that. Um, awesome. Well, first off, just really excited to get to speak to you all at Monerotopia. I mean, obviously, this is the, the remote stage. I know the, the people in person are watching different talks right now. Um, but definitely sad that I had to miss this year in person. Um, unfortunately, both Monero conferences this year, the timing just doesn't work for me with, uh, with family stuff. So I won't be able to make it in person, but really definitely did want to, to speak um, to you all remotely. So looking forward to that. Uh, as always, huge thank you to Doug and Sunita for putting together Monerotopia. Um, just the immense amount of effort that goes into a conference. I think most people don't don't see or understand, but um, I got to volunteer at Monerotopia last year and, and saw a lot of a lot of what the prep that happens on site, uh, not even all the, the stuff that happens beforehand. So a uh, huge thank you to them for, for everything they put in. It's totally of their own free will, effort, et cetera. So it's one of those things that, that makes Monero great is that people are willing to, to take their time uh, and dedicate it to to building Monero, building the Monero community, bringing together devs. Uh, and there's so, so much value that that comes out of conferences like this. So Really excited for that. Um, and excited to jump in today. I I chose a very different topic um, than the things I've talked about in the past. Uh, so normally in the past, I focused on on technical topics or circular economies or um, those types of things that are a little bit more normal for a, a presentation at a Monero conference. But um, just with all that's happened in my time in Monero, uh, with the recent switch from just kind of a regular job to working in Bitcoin full time uh, and how that's kind of gotten me involved in different communities. Uh, I thought that today would be a good chance to kind of do a retrospective and look back on a lot of my time within Monero uh, and on kind of how I've seen the, the Monero community grow, struggle, um, be shaped uh, over the, the, the past few years. Um, so looking forward to getting into this. Uh, the Big disclaimer here is that when I am saying negative things about the Monero community, note that I'm I'm likely part of the problem there and have been part of the problem historically. Um, so this isn't something where I'm just kind of decrying what everyone else is doing, uh, but it's definitely one where these are lessons that I've learned because I've been the one um, kind of doing things the wrong way sometimes. So this presentation will start out a little bit more negative, uh, but we'll, we'll shift more positive towards the end. Uh, and I think there's some, some good takeaways. Um, so I hope you'll stick with me. It's not necessarily the most like fun talk, but I think it's a very important one, uh, because making conscious decisions about how we shape the culture around Monero, uh, is vital to the, the, the longevity of Monero. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and hop in here. Um, so just kind of a quick recap of how I ended up where I am today. Um, and I think that'll help to describe why I'm talking about this topic, uh, and the, the, the specific things that I walk through. Um, but just for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, as you can see on screen, I'm, I'm Seth for privacy. Um, uh, I've been in the Monero project, uh, initially just very loosely and over the years getting much, much more active and engaged, um, for over five years now, uh, which is pretty crazy, but because of that, I've kind of seen a lot of a lot of the the highs and lows of the things that we've gone through as a community, the the, the technical changes, the hard forks, um, the devs coming in and out, uh, just a lot of the stuff that's happened over five years in Monero's history is is a lot. I know there are people who have been here for for longer, or even the entirety of Monero's history, but um, five years in in this scene is is usually pretty long time. So uh, the majority of that I've spent deeply, deeply immersed in the Monero project and community. Um, I was trying to quantify how many hours I've spent engaged in Monero stuff, but I have absolutely no clue. So um, it's really, it's all been in time outside of work and, and outside of life and family. So uh, it's been whatever time I can grab, but it's really been countless hours moderating Matrix, Reddit, uh, engaging in conversations, welcoming newcomers, writing up content, um, educating on Twitter, fighting the good fight uh, against Bitcoin maximalists on Twitter for Monero. Um, dispelling some of the most common FUD around Monero, just a, a lot of things here and there in the in the, the niche that I've found to how I can contribute to Monero. Um, and because of that, because I've been so deeply engaged with the Monero community, I've really had to deal with the, the good, the, the amazing things that drew me to Monero, the amazing things that keep me interested in Monero uh, and that keep me engaged with the bad, the things that just kind of come with every community. Um, it's just going to be always the case where there'll be some some bad actors, some some bad situations in a community like this. 
Um, and then the ugly as well, where, where there have been some some more problematic things that I've seen creep into the, the Monero community in the time that I've been here. Um, and then the last major point is really just that a lot of this retrospective approach has come from starting to work on Bitcoin full time since October. Uh, and that because of that, I've had to engage in a very different way with a lot of the Bitcoin community uh, and a lot of the, the Bitcoin maximalist community, which really is uh, one of the problems that I've always had with Bitcoin is that there are, there's a core set of people and a core ethos of gatekeeping that happens within the, at least the more like Twitter central Bitcoin community. Um, and that gatekeeping and the the approach that they take to things uh, has been very detrimental to to Bitcoin. It's been detrimental to me personally wanting to be involved with Bitcoin. I know many of you have, have dealt with a lot of the, the ridiculousness as well. Um, so it's one of those things where no one in our situation in Panera specifically likes their approach, uh, but many people in Bitcoin do support them and back them up. Um, so I've had to take a little bit different of approach and, and been more actively engaged in those circles. So it's made me think back on and kind of where we are with Monero and how we've gotten here. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So to start off on a, a little bit more painful note, um, and just, just as a reminder, I'm including myself in these things. So the things that I say, almost all of them, I was involved in, in some way, in some of these specific situations, uh, I was, I was supporting the people who were attacked some, uh, I was contributing or just silent. These are very, they're very nuanced situations, but they're some of the ones that I've seen as, as more problematic. Um, and obviously this first line might sting a little bit and maybe it's a little bit uh, hyperbolic in the tone, but I think that one of the things that I've seen since I started in Monero up until now is a bit of a shift from a much more open and welcoming community to one where a lot of the conversations that happen specifically on social media like Twitter and Reddit are not very kind and not very open, not very nuanced. Um, and I think a lot of what has happened is that we have this kind of, I think, core hatred within the Monero community for Bitcoin maximalists because they really stand for a lot of things that that we don't agree with for the, the hot old don't spend mentality, for the privacy doesn't matter mentality, for the kind of uh, KYC exchange mentality, all of these things that we really don't like. Um, and we've never appreciated that. But I think along the way, somehow we've repeated many of the problems that caused Bitcoin maximalists to evolve and become what they are today. Uh, and we've just kind of done it with a Monero flavor. So obviously we have different core things that we gatekeep around. We have different core things that we that we stand staunchly against, different core things that maybe we, we don't allow ourselves to apply reason and logic in conversations. Um, and it's been very problematic and it's been pretty painful for me to see as someone who's been deeply involved in the Monero community. Um, and I'll just kind of go over some broader situations where I've seen this. Um, but I think one of the the main ones that I've seen, especially in the last couple of years, is that there is a there's an overarching toxicity in the Monero community. Um, and one more caveat before I go further. This obviously isn't describing everyone. There are people in the Monero community who are not like this, uh, people who do a great job at, at not falling into these, these traps that are common within cryptocurrency communities. Um, but I'll just make broad statements to simplify this. But just to understand that I'm not saying that like every person, if you're not one of the people who's fallen into this trap, um, kudos and and definitely keep keep an eye out to make sure you don't. Um, but in our, our rightful zeal for Monero uh, and for the things that it does well, which are really decentralization, uh, mining and protocol, transactional privacy, these things are fantastic. It's really the best option out there for both of those specific scenarios. Um, I think we've gotten blinded to the other projects and research going on in the space that can be beneficial to Monero uh, and the other projects in the space that can help Monero to grow and help to bring new people into Monero. Um, and very specifically, I think some of the, the harsher examples have been whenever anything comes up with Zcash. Um, I dislike Zcash as much as the next guy. I don't like the overall project. I think that the transactional protocol is fascinating and there's really good pieces. I think the overall project really does stand for very different things than what Monero does. So I understand some of the vitriol, but it's been really painful to watch that if anyone in the Monero community dares to engage with Zcash, even if it's just in the sense of wanting to figure out what in their approach could be helpful for Monero to bring that back to Monero. 
there's been very, very aggressive attacks against those people. Um, so broadly, just any mention of Zcash gets obliterated on, on social media and Reddit, et cetera. Um, but more specifically, we've seen two main, or I've seen two main issues. Um, one of those is that when Havano, which is the decentralized exchange, the, the fork of BISC, it's being built out, uh, was originally being built out by Woodzer and Ercicioni. Um, Ercicioni is no longer with the project, unfortunately. But there were incredibly aggressive attacks of Havano when they explored listing Zcash. Um, and I know this one's very nuanced because people don't want to fund something that goes to help Zcash, but there are real clear benefits to Monero having on and off ramps to other cryptocurrencies in the space, especially other cryptocurrencies that don't have the same regulatory headwinds as Monero. Uh, and we'll get into that more later, but I personally saw a lot of value in that and being open to that, uh, mainly because it allows people in Zcash and in other protocols that are inferior to Monero to be able to get into Monero, to have connections to Monero so they, they have a reason to explore it, a reason to explore what Monero does well. Um, and it allows people to flow into Monero quite well. Uh, and in that whole situation, just because they decided to explore listing Zcash, there was a massive outcry within the Monero community, many, many personal attacks. Um, and it was really the beginning of the end for Ercicioni contributing to Havano um, because of the toxicity of the community. Um, and that's just one specific example. Uh, another one that I, I saw was when, when I started broaching the topic of bringing back trust the CK Starks from Zcash into Monero and using them to, to give us a, a global membership proof instead of a, a ring signature of 16 or 64 or 128, whatever we, we'd have with Seraphis. Um, that was a surprising amount of pushback and hatred, uh, both to me for doing that, which uh, whatever, I, I expected some of that, but also just uh, an unwillingness for a lot of people to even explore or think about what in the protocol of Zcash would be useful to Monero. Um, and that went very against the things that I have come to love about Monero. Because if we look back through Monero's history, really the, the core of Monero's protocol over the years has been either from CryptoNote, where Monero evolved from, from uh, Bitcoin, obviously, or there were things that were integrated that were proposed for other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and pulled into Monero because we saw the value in it. We were willing to actually put in the work and implement something like this on a live network. Um, and we were willing to think critically, to not just blindly accept everything, but to to properly evaluate the solutions and tools that were out there. Um, and because we were willing to do that, Monero has become what it is today. Uh, it wouldn't be here. That we unfortunately have limited dev and research resources. So a lot of the tools that have been built for Monero so far have come from outside. We've tooled them to fit Monero and implemented them. Um, and for some reason that appears to have changed quite a bit. Um, obviously, there's still pieces within the Monero community that are not like this, but um, there's a, a, a lot of vitriol towards other projects in space, other privacy projects, because I feel like a lot of people in Monero see them as competitors or as the enemy, even though they're serving similar purposes. Uh, most of them are providing people with useful privacy, even if it's not as good as Monero or as dependable or default like Monero but they're still useful tools and they're things that we can learn from and, and use to improve Monero. Um, the other main, I guess I'll skip one of the other ones, but um, I think it's, I've seen many times throughout the past couple of years, pretty harsh witch hunts for people who don't perfectly kind of fit the mold of the Monero community. Um, so obviously this will happen in any community, but I think that a lot of the, more of the kind of the anarchists like, anti-government side of the Monero community uh, can be very toxic towards anyone who is not that aggressively like anti-government or that is not that aggressively like anti-company or anti-corporation, all of these things. Uh, and so it's it's ended up pushing out or, or harming a lot of the people who have been contributing to Monero in the past. Um, so there's a lot more that I could cover there, but those are just some some basic examples that I wanted to touch on. Um, I do want to, on, on a, the positive side, I want to note that while this kind of gatekeeping for the Monero community is often taken too far and, and often ends up harming the, the makeup of the community and making us um, more vulnerable to attacks because we, we don't have a, a variety of people and a variety of backgrounds and a variety of philosophies contributing to Monero, um, 
it is still good to be critical and wary of both new people and new companies and projects that enter into the Monero ecosystem. Like, obviously, we, we do need to be careful. We do need to be on guard. We do need to be making sure that there aren't people who are, are scamming or stealing friends from the CCS or things like that. Um, but we have to find balance. We can't just be gatekeeping and preventing anyone who doesn't perfectly fit this idea that we have of a Monero contributor or a Monero community member from joining. Um, but we also have to be wary that we're not allowing people who, who shouldn't be in the community and who are problematic. So it's a tricky balance. That's one that every community will struggle with. Um, but I would definitely urge you to think intentionally about the way that you approach situations that happen in Monero, the way that you approach new people coming into Monero, uh, and try to find balance where you can think critically, not just blindly dismiss, um, but also not just blindly welcome anything and anyone and any idea uh, into the project. Um, and this is something that we have seen in Bitcoin, and, and many of the, the things that we would love to see happen in Bitcoin, specifically around privacy, have been shot down by Bitcoin maximalists who want to act as gatekeepers. They have their own vision of what Bitcoin will be, usually a kind of number go up vision. Uh, and that means that they're averse to protocol changes. Um, and I think in the Monero side, obviously the the kind of Monero maximalism usually doesn't come with a number go up part of things. Um, it has a very different approach, but it can also be harmful to the progress of Monero. Um, and the second main thing that I wanted to to kind of harp on here uh, is, and I am 100% guilty of this as well, um, but I've, I think that we have broadly failed to recognize the tireless efforts of the, the small percentage of the community that does the vast majority of the work. Um, so in every kind of community like this, there's kind of a, an 80-20 rule where 20% of the community does 80% of the work. Um, I would hazard a guess in Monero, it's even worse than that, and it's probably more like 90 to, like, 5% of the community does 95% of the work, but um, there are people who over the history of Monero uh, have poured out their free time to contribute back to Monero. Uh, and very few of them have gotten much recognition for it. Usually developers are a little bit better understood, a little bit better accepted um, by people within the Monero community. But this is, a, a, I think, a, a failing that has hurt the community and has driven good people out of the community because there's been little recognition, little uh, allowance of good faith for these people, um, and really a, a lack of us applauding the work that is being done there. Um, so I have some names up there. I mean, these are people that I have seen as massively impactful within Monero. Uh, many of you maybe don't know some of these names. Um, if you don't know who Celsta is, this guy does so, so much work behind the scenes for every release that goes out, every issue that's opened for support, for logistics around releases. Um, he is doing massive amounts of work. And I think very few people know who he is and even fewer are going out of their way to thank him for his work, to donate to a CCS request, to donate above and beyond to him. Um, and he's, I think, a really good example of this because he's someone who's still actively contributing but has, I think, gained very little uh, like public support for the work that he's done. Um, some other people here, and these ones are more painful to, to look through because they have left the Monero community uh, for different reasons, but mostly community-based reasons. Um, one of those is Diego, who, who used to go by Rerar in the, I have no idea how to say his, his nick uh, or voice, but um, he used to be in the Monero community. There was a, a falling out I don't know, it was maybe a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and I think a lot of the work that he had done didn't didn't gain him good faith. And he made some mistakes. It wasn't a perfect situation, but he was very much victimized and attacked by members of the Monero community. Uh, and even, even um, entrapped into being recorded against his will and that, that recording being used as, as evidence of why he should be canceled. And that was a messy situation. Um, but some, I think, less messy ones that people maybe don't realize are Need Money 90, Serang, and Saray. Um, So hopefully some of you know the name Serang. Um, obviously, he has been a, a core part of why Monero is where it is today. Uh, he, was a, he is a fantastic researcher. Um, he currently works for CypherStack, but he's he's done absolutely amazing work for Monero over the years. Um, so I think he probably has the most uh, noticeable name in the community, um, but he's one that that 
I think when you look at the story of people like Need Money 90, Sarang and Saray, a lot of the issues and the reasons that they faded out was because they had to deal with so much angst and uh, toxic oversight from the community. Uh, it was it was problematic to them in that it, it essentially made them burn out over the long term. Um, I, there are obviously other reasons for why they've stepped back and, and don't contribute anymore, but a lot of it was down to the uncertainty of the CCS, the uh, amount of oversight that the community had, and it was problematic there. Um, so I don't want to harp too long on that because we can. I, I really want to get into the, the positive side of things. But these are some examples. I'm happy to talk through these more in the Q and A or with, with anybody outside of this. Um, but yeah, those those are some, and I think that these people should be more broadly appreciated, especially the ones who are still helping out with Monero, like Celsta, Tevador. Uh, SECH1, um, Justin, or SGP, if you know him by that. Uh, these are people who are still doing work on Monero and doing fantastic work and, and really should be applauded for the, the years of sacrifice that they put in to help aid Monero and get it to where it is today. So turning on towards a more positive bent, um, looking at what we can do better as a community. Uh, and again, I include myself in these. These are the things that, that I need to improve on as well. Um, but the first one is really just that if you use Monero, uh, and especially if you're listening to this, because you have to be pretty deeply involved in the Monero community to be attending a conference virtually or in person, there is something you can do and need to do within Monero to help Monero grow. Um, obviously, it is all voluntary. No one's going to force you to do anything. But if you choose to just sit on the sidelines, benefit from other people's good work, and not contribute back in some way, you ultimately, uh, it's kind of a harsh truth, but you ultimately are harming the growth of Monero long-term. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to learn how to write in C++ and learn how to code for Monero. The, I think a lot of the work that needs to be done around Monero is non-technical and non-development related. Um, but this is one of those areas where every single person who loves Monero, especially if they love it enough to actually be engaged in the community, like in Reddit, Matrix, going to conferences, et cetera, there is something that you can do that can directly aid Monero and that can directly help other people benefit more from Monero or find Monero for the first time. Um, that really could be just as simple as talking about Monero in your circles. We all have spheres of influence where we have a direct uh, and unique ability to influence the opinions and views of others that no one else can. There are, there are people that you know that I do not know that I cannot influence that will never follow me on Twitter or whatever but you can influence and help to show them why Monero is important, why it matters, and how it's useful. Um, some more examples, uh, and all of these are really non-technical, is you can be writing guides for using Monero. Uh, a big need within the space is for people to better understand how to actually use the tools. And when people who are, are less technical write guides, they're actually more useful because if you don't understand the inner workings of something or you don't understand the kind of the deep technical pieces. When you write a guide, it's much more useful to people who also don't understand the deep technical uh, implications of a tool. So it's a lot harder to write a guide that's useful for everyone when you're technical because there are a lot of assumptions that you just make because of what you know when you're approaching something. So I think that's a that's a, a clear one right there. Um, another way that that you can help out is by writing or updating documentation for Monero, uh, updating pages on the website, uh, writing blog posts and updates for getmonero.org. The website is open source. Uh, it relies on contributors to step in and keep it up to date, to keep it fresh, to write new content for it. And that's something that I think many of you could help with uh, right now, even if it's just updating things as they go stale. Um, another good way would be just being active in either the Monero support subreddit or on Matrix, welcoming new users, helping to answer questions, uh, just really being kind of a an impromptu form of support for people who are coming into Monero. Uh, I think that's... I think it's a very important piece there. Um, and then some other ways that that I've covered before, and, and I'm sure you're aware of, but just to just to harp on how impactful this can be, donating to CCS proposals. So when, when developers, researchers, contributors to the community step up and ask for funding to the Monero CCS, donations from you and me and everyone else go a long way to helping to support them, helping to encourage them to, to keep doing the work um, and is is very impactful. Um, and then the, the last real one that I wanted to harp on there is taking the time to give detailed feature and bug feedback to developers of every piece of Monero software is 
understated and just absolutely vital. One of the things that is always a problem when you're developing a tool like a Monero wallet or something like that is that the vast majority of users who have issues or who have ideas for new features will never tell the devs about them. They'll never know and they'll, they'll never know that it's something that's harming the user experience for other people. And so if you, as someone who's more active in the Monero community, as you just use the tools, as you use Cake Wallet, as you use Monero Yo, as you, you use Feather Wallet, if you take the time when you find a bug or when you realize like, hey, it would be really nice if this specific feature would work this way. If you took the time to go to GitHub, to go to an email address, whatever the, the best method for contacting these people is, and just let them know, share with them, give them as much detail as you can, as much of the thought process behind it. That goes a long ways towards improving the tooling around Monero. Because uh, it helps developers to see what users actually experience when they use the app. Uh, and it's something that's very easy to to imitate through internal testing for developers. Uh, and it's very, very important. The second main thing that I wanted to mention here, and, and I, I harped on a little bit in the section before, but uh, it's really just to to welcome new ideas. Um, it's to to not be closed off, to not assume that the way Monero does everything is perfect and um, immaculate and untouchable, but to to welcome new ideas and how we can improve both technically and as a community, but continue to be critical of them. Uh, as I said, when I joined Monero, a lot of the reason why I started to care about Monero was because the community was not only welcoming personally, but they were extremely critical of what went on in the community. They were always making sure that the, the approaches we took, that the the technical and community aspects we were constantly analyzing, talking about, having open, nuanced conversation about these things. And it allowed us to iterate the protocol and grow the community in ways that wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't had these open and honest conversations about hard topics. Um, now, a lot of the, the hard conversations led to us not implementing things that shouldn't have been implemented, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's important that we find that balance where we welcome new ideas, we use logic, we use rationale, we use history, we use all these things to try and gauge if this this thing or this new intern or whatever is useful. Um, we continue to be critical, but we we ultimately try our best to be welcoming to new people and to new ideas, uh, and then kind of do a litmus test of the value after that. Um, I think that's the main one there. Um, the next major point is just realizing that we reach the most people with Monero when we take the time to build financial and educational bridges between us and other communities. Uh, I think this is something that I'll, I'll focus on more in the next section, but when we take the time to focus on how we can integrate, uh, communicate, cooperate <laughs> with, uh, with other communities in the space, uh, sp specifically in the other cryptocurrencies that align pretty well with Monero, um, and then also in the specifically the privacy community, I think is the one that's very underserved by the Monero community in that we can act as bridges, each of us act as bridges into these communities um, and do what we can to help to help them understand what Monero does well, what it can offer them and why they should take the time to download a Monero wallet and test it out. Um, there's a lot that we can do individually for this. Uh, and the last one, super simple, but it's just be active outside of the normal Monero circles, outside of Matrix, outside of our subreddit, um, and talk about what Monero brings to the table. Now, what I don't want and what I'm not telling you is to be kind of a, a Monero reply guy that just hates on everything about Bitcoin or anytime anyone doesn't specifically call out every piece of privacy that's necessary or anytime someone talks about fungibility, not just being that reply guy that just hits them with three words and runs. But take the time to engage meaningfully with people, to be nuanced in your discussions, to uh, be well-meaning in the way that you approach these conversations, and just to be helpful. I mean, most people out there, if they know the name of Monero, they don't understand how it works or what it is today. They probably have a very outdated false opinion about what Monero is. Uh, and reply guying is not the way that we fix that. The way that we fix that is by taking the time to sit down and be reasonable to, to walk them through what Monero is, how it works today, how it can be useful for them. And this is where I've seen tons of success in onboarding people from Bitcoin and other communities into actually using Monero day to day. Because usually when they've run into people in Monero or in other cryptocurrency projects, they just get the kind of reply guy, four words, I'm out, blocked, whatever uh, response. But if you're willing to take that time to engage in a nuanced, well-meaning and helpful way, it really goes a long way to just 
connecting other people, helping them to understand what Monero is, uh, and taking the the leap into actually using Monero. So, the last kind of uh, major point that I had is is just that in my time in Monero, for for quite a bit of it, I thought that we could win all on our own. That we didn't need anyone else. We didn't need any other projects. We didn't need on and off ramps with the Bitcoin. We didn't need anything else. We were the best. We had the best technology. We had the best user experience as far as privacy was concerned. That we would just win. We didn't need to worry about it. Unfortunately, I think that I was wrong for most of that time. Uh, and when I thought that we could win alone, it was missing the broader picture of what, at least what I care about within Monero and what I want to bring to people. And ultimately that is, I want to bring people freedom. I don't really care if they gain that freedom through Bitcoin, if they're able to gain freedom through it. Obviously, that can be tricky in Bitcoin. Uh, if they gain that freedom through Zcash, if they gain that freedom through Firo, uh, whatever they gain freedom through, I'm happy. I want that to happen. Uh, and the way that we help the most people gain freedom is that we get Monero into the most hands. The way that we do that uh, is by not standing on our own by being willing to to break down barriers to be open to working with other projects in some sense not that we need to collaborate or let other projects affinity scam off of us or anything like that but um, to be a little bit more specific monero is going to face regulatory pressure monero works it's used and that's a problem for governments uh it's unfortunate it's not the way it should be um regulatory pressure is not going to stop monero but what they will do is they will limit the on and off ramps to and from Monero. And in doing so, they will cut off the majority of kind of normies from accessing Monero. Uh, and that is bad. That means that many people will not have easy access to a tool that can gain them financial freedom. Um, so the way that we get around that is that we leverage the on and off ramps for other cryptocurrencies. Specifically, I think Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most important here. But when we embrace bridges to other chains, things like decentralized exchanges, no KYC exchangers, et cetera, we can actually allow people to use Monero that would never have a way to use it. Uh, when we look at, I think, what works today and where the future is going, uh, things like local Monero, Agora Desk, and BISC are absolutely vital to Monero's reach today. Many people do not have a centralized exchange that they can buy Monero through, which in many cases is a good thing because they can't get harmed by KYC, but it also means that many people just say, you know, I'd love to play around with Monero, but I have no way to get it, so I'm just going to move on. Thankfully, there are fantastic options, specifically local Monero, I think is the best of everything out there right now. And that means that people in, in many places can get access to Monero uh, in meaningful ways. Um, those things are great for today, but those kinds of on-ramps are probably going to get cut off as well. Um, BISC should stay up, but Local Monero and Agora Desk, I don't know that they'll be around forever uh, because unfortunately governments do not want us to have privacy. They do not want us to be able to trade directly with each other without government oversight. Um, so when we look to the future, we have really, really big, important projects. Sarai, where, which uh, Kayabaner, Luke, who's here uh, at the conference speaking in person, the project he's building out is going to be, I think, one of the essential bridges between Monero and the rest of the cryptocurrency ecosystem that leaves the gates open for Monero. Uh, Havano, um, when that's complete, will be a big piece of that as well, and that it'll be BISC, but much better for Monero users. Uh, Farcaster, atomic swaps between Bitcoin and Monero is a huge piece of that as well. These things are vital to Monero's long-term success and reach because even if the on and off ramps to Monero are just completely choked off and restricted, if people can get Bitcoin, which I think will, will remain open at least a lot longer than Monero, they can then take that Bitcoin swap for Monero and have financial freedom. We need that to remain open. So we need to support these projects and these uh, companies like uh, Local Monero and Agora Desk that are helping to make that possible today. Um, the second one, and this one may be more subjective, but when I look back at what Monero is, where it started, uh, where we've gotten to, I think that if we silo ourselves and we try to stand without any other projects, if we try to say, we don't need Bitcoin, we don't need Ethereum, we don't need these bridges, we don't need exchanges, we just need Monero, it'll keep working, we'll win. I think that we'll probably fade into obscurity. There are many, many, many examples throughout history of technologies that were better than anything else that lost because they didn't gain enough acceptance in the market, they didn't have a, a clear fit, 
and they never became the the thing that people used. Um, so while even if Monero fades into obscurity, it can still be helpful tools to people like us. I want this to have the broadest reach possible. And the way that we do that is by connecting with others in the broader cryptocurrency space. I want it so that if someone wakes up to the need for financial freedom, they come into cryptocurrency through Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever. I want them to have clear ways that they will learn about Monero. They'll learn how it works, the benefits it brings in those other communities. If people have to come deeply into the Monero community to learn what Monero is and how it's valuable, we will drastically limit our reach. So I think a lot of what we need to be doing is being active in other communities, being helpful, being being on ramps in the community sense from other communities that have some sort of shared ethos. If that's the, the Bitcoin community that's more freedom focused, the Ethereum community that's more uh, freedom, privacy focused, et cetera being the bridge between them and helping to connect and make sure that Monero is in those conversations. That's a very important thing. Uh, and then the last one is just kind of a, I don't know, it's pretty simple. It's just that Bitcoin can still be a powerful tool for freedom. Uh, this is something that I see in the Monero community a lot where people dismiss Bitcoin entirely. And I have done this myself for years of dismissing Bitcoin entirely as being a useless tool because it doesn't have the strong privacy assurances of Monero. Uh, and while the lack of privacy does limit its effectiveness, in many real world scenarios today, Bitcoin is a very powerful tool for freedom where Monero cannot be because of its lack of reach, because of lack of education, whatever the reason. In many of these situations, people only have access to Bitcoin or only know about Bitcoin and it provides freedom. It works. Will it work forever? Probably not. Will the lack of privacy get people harmed in the future? And is it getting people harmed now? Yes. But it can still be a very powerful tool for freedom. Um, and when we realize that fact, we realize that there is a massive untapped force of people within Bitcoin who would see eye to eye, I think, with Monero and would understand its use. This is a lot of what I've been trying to do over the last year and a half or two years of kind of acting as a bridge between more freedom focused Bitcoiners and Monero, starting to introduce them to what Monero is and how it can be a valuable tool for their freedom to make their lives easier. Um, but we need more people doing that. We need people to, to help. Bitcoiners are starting to come to grips with the lack of privacy. They're starting to come to grips with the fact that the current privacy tools are difficult to use, have issues, have clear major issues that will cause problems long term. And we have a tool. We have a solution for them. Monero can be the, the layer two, layer three, whatever you want to call it, for Bitcoiners who are seeking freedom. Uh, and, and ultimately, we need to get out there and do that. Um, and really quickly as well, just kind of if we embrace this as not being a one money wins situation, but we embrace this as lots of things are going to exist, how do we make the most out of that? I think we can bring a lot of people into Monero today by pitching Monero as a tool for spending. And then once they get comfortable with spending it, they'll start to understand where the store of value aspect comes in. Um, so that's a little bit of a side, but I think that we really can come alongside Bitcoiners who want freedom and often offer them a, a very powerful tool for their toolkit that makes their lives easier and empowers their Bitcoin. It makes their Bitcoin more useful because they can swap it into Monero and spend. They can still save in Bitcoin if they want, but they ultimately get the best toolkit that way. And they get more financial freedom that way. We get better privacy because we have more people using Monero, et cetera, et cetera. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. So last slide I have here, and I have no idea how long I've been going, um, but last slide I have is, is really just kind of how do I see Monero's future? Um, and another, just a very optimistic focus here uh, in that even though this presentation has been a little bit more critical of the Monero community and of the project as a whole, uh, it's because I love Monero and I want to see Monero succeed. I want to see it have the broadest reach possible. I want to see the community stay strong and vibrant. Um, and a lot of the reasons why I want to see that are because of the things in this slide. I absolutely think that Monero, while it already holds this spot right now, it's a little bit tenuous, but Monero will cement itself as the most viable tool for financial privacy once we have global membership proofs, the thing that can come through these trustless CK snarks that 
I think you're hearing about from Amir Taki while he's here, uh, as some friends of mine are working on. The combination of that and Seraphis will make Monero the most powerful privacy tool for finances today, bar none. Nothing will come close. Zcash will not compare. Nothing will compare to Monero at that point. Uh, and that will mean that the market around privacy coins will be over. It, it's done. I, th I think that at this point, nothing else will be able to touch Monero. Uh, and that makes me very excited because it will end kind of the privacy coin wars. Um, and it will mean that this amazing tool that I've seen amazing people build will kind of have settled the, settled the debate as to what is the most useful financial privacy tool. That also means that it will be much more approachable uh, and much more broadly recognized because people won't have to make a decision between 27 different privacy coins. It'll be pretty clear what the right choice is. I think it already is, but it'll be even more clear. Um, and part of that will be that most freedom-loving people, the people who are in cryptocurrency for anything more than number go up, will settle on Monero as the tool of choice for spending. Um, while the Lightning Network has some interesting possibilities, while other Layer 2s and Layer 3s on, on Bitcoin and Ethereum have interesting possibilities, they all have complications. They all have major, major trade-offs that happen when you go outside of a Layer 1 cryptocurrency. Um, and Monero doesn't have any of those problems. When I'm trying to walk someone through using Lightning properly, it's kind of a nightmare. It's it's kind of a just absolutely shitty experience. And it is improving. There are really good things that are being built out around it. Uh, I am hopeful for it long term, but I can onboard someone to any Monero wallet today. They have strong privacy on chain. Uh, they don't have to worry about inbound liquidity and all of this other stuff. It just, it fits. If people want to spend cryptocurrency, Monero is the best tool. It's just, it. That is just what it is today. Uh, and I want to see that grow. And as that grows, more and more people will will flow in. As the, the circular economies grow, more people will flow in. Um, this is kind of how we will win the, the medium of exchange aspect. Um, the next point is just a really quick one, but I think as we see people continue to slowly flow into Monero, the design of the actual protocol itself is perfect for this. Uh, the way that we've approached uh, incrementally improving efficiency of transactions, the way that we approach slowly increasing the anonymity set, the way that we're approaching Seraphis and, and hopefully global membership proofs, all of these things are going to fit very well for this slow ramp of adoption. We're not going to need to worry about handling as many transactions as Bitcoin for a while. Uh, and I think that's totally okay. The slow ramp will fit well. I think eventually, as I talked about last year, uh, an L2 will be necessary for Monero, but I think that's still a ways in the future, and the current design will be fantastic for for where I see things going. Um, and then the last one, uh, just to kind of summarize a lot of these points, is that Monero will dominate the freedom tech space. If people understand the need for freedom and they want to get it through technology, Monero will be one of the tools in everyone's toolkit. Uh, and through that, when we unlock financial privacy for people, we unlock freedom in many other ways because it makes it easier to pay for VPN services, to pay local farmers, to get into the circular economy, to get the goods and services that they need that maybe they couldn't get because of a tyrannical regime or other things. And, and this financial freedom that you gain through Monero unlocks broader freedom tech. And that's an absolutely fantastic thing. Um, so I think that's all that I want to cover today. I uh, obviously touched on a lot of things, um, full disclosure, I've been slammed and came up with this presentation uh, in the last 14 hours or so. So it's very last minute, but it's a lot of things that have been kind of brewing in my mind and and in my my thoughts as I've kind of transitioned less or transitioned out of the Monero community a bit and more into Bitcoin and had to run into a lot of the things uh, that I've I've seen in Monero but hadn't kind of put words to. Um, so hopefully this is one that's not discouraging but encourages you to think deeply about the way that you engage in the community, the way that you uh, analyze and approach new ideas and research and development and community contributions. Um, and ultimately that you, you try to take active steps towards contributing to Monero in some way, not necessarily as a developer, but finding some niche that you can fill that can help Monero to grow, that can help Monero to improve, that can keep the community vibrant, that can help us to grow the project over the long term. Because ultimately Monero, I think, will be the most important tool for freedom for those people who find it, and we need to make sure that more people find it and can use Monero. So I think that that's it. Uh, I think we're doing questions. I'm not 100% sure. Um, Alex, if you're around. I'm around. <laughs> awesome. Oh, excellent. Um, there is one question I can see in chat right now. It is, 
how do these majorities, in quotes, form in the development community that are responsible for nasty behaviors like our way or the highway? Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I think the way that they actually form varies depending on the community. Um, but normally the, the way that they gain power is through, funnily enough, the toxicity and the approaches that they take being done in secret or in some way being hidden from the broader community so that they can't see the, the toxic and dangerous approach that's being taken by them. Um, these people are almost always not the majority, uh, actually they're the minority. Um, but they, they become a vocal minority in the community by slowly building up sentiment behind them. Uh, a lot of it just comes down to mob mentality and stirring people up for the specific cause that they have. I think a lot of the, the conflict in the Monero community has been started by, really a small number of people who have contributed to it. But once they do, a lot of people will come out of the kind of out of the surroundings and, and jump in and join in because there's, there's very much a mob mentality in all of us and, and a desire to fit in. And when we see someone being vocal about these things, um, it's problematic. It's hard to say exactly how they form, but I think a lot of it is really just a, it's almost always a very small cabal within the community and one that can be ousted and can be shunned and pushed aside by the actual majority in the community. Because I think the majority of people in Monero are not like this, but the problem is the majority of people who are, not the majority, but many of the people who are active and speaking out uh, become like this as a community progresses, as it gets more cemented, as there's less internal debate or maybe reason for hard conversations internally it slowly leads to kind of an ossification of the community. Um, kind of like how we talk about an ossification of the Bitcoin protocol, communities ossify as well. And as they grow larger, there are these kind of bad actors that will will cause worse sentiment. Um, but really the best defense we have is each of us being intentional about how we approach these situations, not just diving in, not just jumping on the bandwagon, but thinking deeply, making sure when we're going to speak out, when we're uh, going to dismiss a tool or jump on someone because they mentioned something we don't like, uh, that we take personal responsibility and, and do what we can to help to, to kind of stave that off and, and make sure that we're staying critical but open, that we're staying uh, nuanced and that we're engaging in good faith, all of these things that are really just kind of like basic civility things, um, but they quickly fall apart in online communities like this. Yeah, yeah, these are, all of these are absolutely excellent are fantastic points that you know we need to hear more of it you know it it seems pervasive in pretty much any any community of people these yeah. things but um yeah in order to comment that we have to you know keep reminding ourselves like you are and you know make an active effort here's another one what are some techniques approaches or methods that have worked for you to ensure you are continuing rational open dialogue how do you guard against losing sight of intellectual honesty and open mm. that's a really good one um i oh, see it's from privacy dad uh great guy um glad that he, he jumped in for this um so for me i think the biggest one i don't know there's there's kind of two major things i, I think one of them is making sure that you don't let financial investments cloud your vision. I mean, this is the core of the problem that happens in almost any cryptocurrency community is that we we kind of form religions tied with money because communities ultimately kind of devolve into religions over the long term. Uh, it's just kind of something that happens with the good and the bad of that. Religion isn't necessarily evil or wrong. Um, but when we combine that with the ability to make large amounts of money, things get very problematic. Um, so I think for me, it's been a very conscious effort to not put my financial benefit above the good of other people. I know that sounds a little weird to say. It kind of sounds like, I don't know, um, altruistic or like, I'm not trying to, I don't know, I'm not trying to kind of like speak good about myself, but just that that's been a very hard but conscious effort of mine to to not get my pay or my income or the the dollar value of Monero not letting that affect the way that I approach things and rather trying to stay focused on the broad picture of how we can bring freedom to the most people. Um, the other main thing is really just not buying into the 
the garbage mentality that is it is just a core part of modern online social media society which is that you have to respond now you have to be the fastest you have to be the first you have to be a part of it right when everything's happening uh and if we slow down uh, one of the things i i can guarantee you that the worst conversations i've had have been ones where i have been compulsively replying because i feel like i need to reply quickly and those are the ones where i make mistakes where i lack openness and honesty where I, I lack nuance. It's because I am not taking the time to step back, think on it, digest a situation, and then figure out what's the way that I want to approach this. Uh, and a lot of this is just down to the faults with modern social media and that it, it incentivizes us to rush in and be the first. Um, but if we slow down, we sit on something, especially if it, if it deeply upsets us, like my approach when I can, and I'm not good at this, it's something that is a constant struggle, is if there's something that deeply upsets me, I try to wait until the next day to address it because I can usually detach some of the emotion, some of the kind of vitriol that I may approach it with otherwise um, from the response that I have the next day. Um, so there's just kind of like, I don't know, those are ways that that I approach it. Um, and each person will have specific things that they need to to focus on when they're, they're trying to be intentional about this. But it really starts with just not following the mob mentality and taking the time to think intentionally and deeply about the approach that you want to take about the difference that you want to make because it's very much a, it's a personal responsibility thing where if you just go with the flow you're going to become part of the problematic crowd almost always um, but if you're willing to take that time to think intently on these types of topics on these situations on the the drama that happens within the mirror community and not jump in at the beginning but think intently on what's going on what are the facts how can i help the situation either to resolve it or to defend someone, whatever, uh, and really just kind of taking the time to think intentionally about that is a, a huge step forward. Yeah, this is all so great to hear. You have a, you have such a refined mindset. It's, it's uh, really refreshing. I, uh, I really hope the community takes on, takes on a lot of the, uh, the thinking that you've provided here today. Um, there's one more question I see. It goes, is there a pattern in these, inner bad actors like them being subpar technically or regional clans or psychological issues if there is a pattern is there a better way of preventing it um and he also compliments thanks for a fab honest presentation <laughs> yeah um i don't know it's hard to say um usually i mean usually the root of the people who are the most problematic that are the vocal minority is a desire for some sort of personal gain is at the root of it. Um, so obviously like everyone naturally works for their own gain. Uh, and that's something that I think we, we each have to battle to be able to put that aside and in, in many situations to, to work for the broader good rather than our own personal gain. But I think the, the core of all of these people, they can come from different backgrounds. They can be, I mean, I, I have been one of these people that can be a bad actor. I have been problematic. I have contributed to drama in ways that I shouldn't. Um, and it usually comes down to wanting to get something for yourself, whether that's just pride and recognition, whether that's power in the community, whether that's just pure financial incentives of wanting to make sure that nothing happens with Monero so that number can go up or, or whatever the incentives are. Uh, normally it's something like that. So. It's hard to tie it to like region or uh, a lack of technicality. Um, I mean, most of the bad actors are not technical. I, I don't know why that is. Um, <laughs> they're usually not the developers themselves who are contributing code. It's usually people who are not contributing in any meaningful way. Um, but it's hard to it's hard to say specifically. I think the the clearest gauge is usually that they're people who don't actually contribute to the project in meaningful ways, uh, and they just want to gain power or something for themselves in other ways rather than actually just actively contributing. Um, so a lot of it is that. And so a lot of it is try to, to gauge if this person is not contributing in any other way, but they're starting this drama, what could their possible incentives be? Why could they be doing this? Um, should I trust them? And I mean, uh, uh, another kind of thing that I've been trying to focus on lately is just not to take personal attacks or criticism seriously when they come from people that I, I don't have a relationship with or that I don't want a relationship with. And the same thing can kind of be said for communities in that if there's someone who's constantly stirring up drama by criticizing people who are actively contributing or working on Monero or doing research dev work, 
content creation, whatever, if they're constantly attacking those people, try to look and see like what what's their output? What are they doing? What are they doing to actually help improve Monero and grow the project or the community, et cetera? And if there's no value there, if they're not actually contributing in any meaningful way that you can see, it's probably a good sign that they're a bad actor and they're someone that that should be kind of pushed aside. You should move on. You should um, try to shut down the drama that they're creating uh, and, and come to the defense of those people who are actually contributing to Monero in meaningful ways. Yeah, definitely. I think the the technical term for these bad actors is posers. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Hell, uh, there's there's one more from the privacy dad. If you'd like to take one more question, um, it is what do you what do you make of the pervasive attitude in the privacy communities that the the that the reason the mainstream hasn't uh, onboarded privacy tools like Monero is because they're lazy, ignorant, or stupid. I think that it. I don't, I don't know. It's it's hard because I agree in a sense that most people haven't woken up to the need for privacy because they haven't been intentional about thinking about where they want to be and where the world is going. Um, but I don't think that we can attribute that to laziness or ignorance or stupidity. Um, and obviously the the toxicity that's pervasive in the the privacy community where Essentially, everyone should be as private as me. Anyone who isn't is is stupid and wasting their time and and ruining their future, is dangerous. And it, it's a it's a lot of the same roots as the things that that we have problems with at Monero and every other cryptocurrency community. Um, and it's this desire to build a, a moat around myself to do things for me and to benefit myself through that. Um, but I think that when we look at like why people haven't adopted privacy tools like Monero. I think there are two main reasons. One of them is that people just don't have a historical or current reason to think about privacy. Uh, and everyone innately wants privacy. If you talk to anyone, they want privacy for most things. Uh, but most people haven't come to grips with what a lack of privacy means for them. And especially in the West, where historically we haven't had, where we haven't had governmental issues at a broad scale. Obviously, there have been government issues, but there hasn't been like a complete collapse or a tyrannical regime in charge in like America and, and much of the Western world. Um, and because of that, people are very trusting of governments. And that is fine when the government's great. And that's very, very dangerous when the governments are shifting towards authoritarianism. Um, so a lot of it comes from people not understanding the risks. Uh, and so a lot of it is just the sad truth that people have to get burned by something happening to them in real life or to something happening to someone they know or someone they follow online uh, in real life. And that's usually the way that people wake up. The other main reason that I think people haven't onboarded to tools like Monero, um, and I know I work out kind of getting away from like the attitude in the privacy community, but I'm trying to get to the root of why it hasn't happened. A lot of it is education and failings on our part as a community from getting the word out there actively outside of our circles. We're great about talking internally about Monero, we're not very good about being active on other communities, other platforms with Monero. Um, so a lot of it is just education. People don't know that Monero is a thing. Like they don't even know that it, it exists. Almost everyone knows that Bitcoin exists. Very few people know that Monero exists or what it is or why they should use it. Uh, and then the other major reason is just really that a lot of the user experience around Monero hasn't been ideal so far. It has gotten drastically better in the last year. There are tons of improvements coming. I think the the address changes with Seraphis will be a big step forward. The, the the view key changes with Seraphis will be a big step forward. But a lot of it comes down to we need more people building out uh, useful and approachable tools for Monero. Uh, and a lot of that comes from somehow wooing companies into building on Monero and building out profitable companies around Monero as a tool. Um, and so I think we should be cheering on companies like Cake Wallet, who are building fantastic tools for Monero, making a profit doing it, and contributing back to Monero as a result. That is the kind of thing that we want more of. We need more of because those kinds of things bring in fresh blood, bring in money and resources to help to build out more user-facing and usable pro uh, products. So I think it's a that's a piece of it. Um, but I think the the pervasive attitude is just 
I don't know. It's it's dangerous because people think that they have somehow like become enlightened because they understand the need for privacy. But like I, I only know about privacy or care about it because people in the Monero community showed that to me because I, I, I thankfully didn't have to have something bad happen to me before I woke up. But I had people who shook me awake when I joined the Monero community. And we need more people going out there to, to do that and helping people to understand what the risks are. Because um, I think a lot of it is just we're happy to stay in our, our little community and, and our, in our circle and not branch out of that. All right. There are, there's been a bit of a, Gabe has been asking questions about pirate. I had to look it up myself. It's, it's pirate chain. R. are you, have you heard of this? Uh, he's saying, where did the hate uh, from the XMR community come come from towards towards Pirate? Ooh, um, yeah. I mean, I've been involved in a lot of the a lot of the, a lot of the drama between the projects over the years, so I can definitely speak to it. Um, okay. So very quickly, the reason why there's a lot of vitriol from the Mayor project towards the Pirate Chain product project is twofold, I think. Uh, and both of these are personal reasons as well why I don't like the PyroChain project. Um, one of them is that PyroChain has not actually created anything interesting. Uh, and that's, if you're a PyroChain supporter, you won't like that statement, but all the PyroChain has done is forked an old version of Zcash and made sure that people can theoretically only make private transactions. They haven't develop the protocol in any meaningful ways. They've done some very non-ideal approaches to network security. They've had ASIC problems. They have issuance problems. There are a lot of core issues with the protocol, and there's just been nothing interesting about it, nothing useful contributed back to the space because of it. Uh, and so I think a lot of people in the free and open source space view that as kind of leeching off of the work of others. Uh, not that it's should be banned. You should be able to do that. That should be fine. Um, but it's not a good look when a project is really just a fork of another project and doesn't contribute meaningfully in any way. Um, so obviously it can be used, can be used privately, whatever. Um, the other main problem that there's a lot of vitriol is that the vast majority of interactions that I've had or the content that I've seen out of the pirate chain community uh, is either scammy in the sense of trying to promote it as something that you can make money off of uh, and not as a tool for privacy, even though that's a piece of it and a piece of the pitch. Um, and then the other main problem is that a lot of the power chain involvement that I've seen has been what's called affinity scamming, which is where they try to latch on to the reputation of Monero and to the, the name recognition of Monero and to the usefulness of Monero. Um, and they, they do so to benefit themselves and they try to make people think that if they like Monero and if Monero works, they should use power chain because it's better. And like, that's almost all the interactions I've had with the community. So. I think those are the main reasons. Um, there are others. There are some good people in the pirate chain community, um, but ultimately, I think that it's a situation where they should either really change something and drastically build towards uh, an improvement, and actually like doing something different from the space, uh, contributing back to the space, or they should just fold the project and start working on Monero. Uh, I think that would be the best for everybody because we we don't need eighteen different privacy coins. We don't need these kind of tiny market cap privacy coins that don't provide strong privacy because so few people use them. Uh, and so it would be better if those people were contributing to Monero, especially with Monero likely doing something like global membership proofs, which is the the core of the benefit that Zcash and forks of it have over Monero and privacy. As we'll be implementing something like that, that's even, uh, even more useful for people who have worked with protocols like that to come and help to build Monero, to help to grow the community get the word out there, et cetera. Uh, so a lot of it is just viewing it as like Monero is doing the things that we need. Monero is contributing greatly to the space. So it'd be better if people were just contributing to Monero instead of other kind of scammy affinity scam coins like Pirate Chain, even though there are good people there. I don't want to kind of blindly dismiss everybody. Yeah, definitely. I think I've seen that problem uh, across the open, free and open source space in general where uh, people spread themselves thin because everyone wants, you know, a slice of, uh, you know, to make, to be the, the creator of something. Is it, yeah. that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but maybe the media is uh, a bit exaggerated or uh, exacerbated in the, 
in whenever money's involved when it, when it comes to cryptocurrencies because money's involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think that's the root of the problem and that I think that's not nearly as problematic in the broader FOSS space, but when you can essentially print money by creating a new cryptocurrency and you can print it in a way where you get the majority of it because you're the you have the first mover advantage and mining that cryptocurrency or staking or whatever it is, it makes it much more problematic and creates a lot of incentive for people to just fork a project, change a couple of variables, and try to print money for themselves. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying that's what Pirate Chain people did, but I think that's a, that's the root of a lot of the problems that we've had with smaller projects in the space. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I'm just going to keep asking questions, and you you can tell me whenever you're done, I suppose, because uh, you're the last speaker today, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so the next one is, what are your thoughts on Dero? Um, so I have a whole thread on this, uh, on Twitter, which if you look up at Seth for privacy and Darrow on Twitter, I'm sure you can find it, uh, I see, but, um, it's one of those projects in the space that claims to have solved every problem that ever existed in cryptocurrencies, uh, and does so with one developer and code that's created in secret and published all at once with releases and makes a bunch of fancy claims on the encryption that they use, et cetera, most of which seem to fall apart in like a cursory analysis that I did. Um, so not to necessarily say it's it's evil or bad, but as far as I can tell, it seems to be a scam and has all the kind of the, the red flags that I would attribute to scams, um, most of which are very small dev team, lots of incentives to print money for themselves, um, lots of massive marketing claims that are just completely incomprehensibly impossible, um, et cetera. So it's definitely something where I, I would not recommend anyone use it or deal with it at all. Obviously, if you want to look into it, you should do your own research and not just blindly trust me, but uh, I have a thread that walked through a lot of my thoughts on it because I've been getting tons of questions like this, um, which I'm sure you can you can find pretty easily. I see. Um, if you'd like, if you'd like, we can, you know, be here for another couple minutes in case anyone asks any more questions, but as of right now, I've exhausted all those in chat. Okay. Yeah. I don't see any, any other ones there. I don't think. Awesome. Well, well, there's another one. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, I see it. So I'll, I'll just read it out for you, Alex. Um, so Gabe asked, have I ever chatted with any of the vigilante crew about it? Uh, I'm just wondering why they promote it so hard. Um, yes, I have chatted, uh, with them a good bit on it. Um, I don't know. I don't really want to speculate on their motives. Uh, I think that their time would be much better served if they're seeking the, the good of others to, dedicate that time to Monero and what Monero can be uh, instead of Daryl, because like I said, I, I do think there's a lot of, at the very least, massive red flags about it. Um, but there's also a lot of financial incentives for people to push these small cryptocurrencies where it's much easier to gain a large part of the supply and, and try to make a lot of money off of it. So I don't really know what their motives are behind it. Uh, I don't really want to comment on it there, but um, I would just be wary. Uh, and I would do your own research into what Darrow does. I would look at my thread, read through it, uh, and just at least be very, very wary because of the claims that are made, um, cause they're pretty, pretty incredulous. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you everybody. Thank you for, for running this Alex and, and having me. It was a, it was a blast and glad I was able to, to join in and, and chat and have fun. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad you made it. Um again, it was fantastic. It's great mm -hmm. having you. Um so you're the last speaker of today then. I suppose we'll end it here. Awesome. Well well thank you everybody for jumping in for Monerotopia. I, I hope it's been a blast and I'm really, really sad I didn't get to join in person. So um, Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> that's that's why I'm volunteering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sad days, but maybe ne maybe next year we can get out there. Yeah, definitely next year. I hope to see you there. All right. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody.